Real Brief Podcast. I'm Robert. Yes, and I'm Reggie. And this is Matt Redderer. Uh, and Matt's joined us all the way from Chicago, Illinois, to uh, discuss MRI safety and incidents that he's familiar with. Now, and I just want you to say the last name one more time. Redderer. Redderer. <laughs> uh, thanks for calling me out. Right it's in pretty good. It's pretty I good. just thought out my ears were stuttering or something for a second there. <laughs> That's okay. My name is Robert. That's easy to pronounce. So, <laughs> Matt, welcome. Welcome. Well, thank man. you very much for having me. Yeah, you nice. flew all the way out here just for us. Not really. You're also on vacation with the yeah. missus. So, with the happy missus, yeah. anniversary to you. Well, thank you very um, much. Yeah, yeah. she's yeah. At the pool as we speak. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Good weather. <laughs> it is. It's nice to be able to do that in January. Yeah, right. Oh yeah. February and you're point. stuck with us. So no, that's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, well, mostly, we invited you, and you actually came all the way from Chicago, like I said, to discuss MRI safety issues and incidents that you're familiar with. Um, sounds like you've got quite the background. You've also have the background in CT, I think, right? Yes. Um, did you do X-ray as well? Um, I did X-ray as well. Kind of give me a, just a background or like a just brief yeah, history. Yeah, tell us a little about like yourself. How many years did you have you been doing MRI? Um, I started uh, my my journey in imaging when I was eighteen. So I graduated high school, started X-ray. Um, before I finished X-ray, went into MR, and um, I got a chance to you know study MRI uh, cross train. Which oh, is nice. was the big thing twenty years ago, you know, when I started Gateway this. Drug, right? It is, I know, <laughs> seriously, it really is. And um, you know, from that point on, you know, you start to develop a passion for MRI, mm -hmm. and then um, developed a um, training tool, Right Advantage, in two thousand nine, that helped individuals pass their MRI boards. Uh, at the time, there wasn't much out there, and we started our business right. as a CD-ROM. You know, that kind of dates me a little bit too. <laughs> and uh, so we mail CD-ROMs out to individuals. Now we're cloud-based, so nice. Um, but uh, we we kind of developed that product as to kind of fill that void. There, you know, education was lacking, and still yeah. is in a lot of a lot of avenues. Right. Um, and then right now, I still work clinically in hospital. I you know I do it all. Um, nice. I've done. Uh, chief tech for 11 years. I've done um, uh, administrative chair for um, committees on the um, system, health system, uh, been uh, liaisons between health systems. Man. Um, so I've done a lot. I've built MRI training courses um, at hospitals and online. How a do lot you of... find the time, man? <laughs> and he's got kids too. Yeah, man, got three, so three little ones. And then um, I also work at ECC, um, which is a, a, a community college. You're just bragging now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Off, <laughs> And so I, I teach MR physics and CT physics there. Yeah, nice. very cool. So yeah. it sounds like you got quite the history with MR. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I guess where where do where we start? I mean, we could talk about. Um, well, I think because I I know that you know. MRI safety is really big right now, right? Mm -hmm. And it has been, you know, at least for the last couple of years, it's grown a lot. But I know there's been a few incidents that's kind of pushed MR safety, mm -hmm. you know, to the forefront. And I know back in 2001 with the uh, the, the young kid that died, Come right? Beating, yep. Yeah. And that was like when it really, like, if that didn't wake people up, then they weren't going to wake up at all. Exactly. And that woke a lot of people up, right? For sure. And uh, I guess to kind of start off, I guess we can talk about the different injuries you can get in MRI. Sure. Yeah, because I know there's a there's a few other than just the big magnet, which is probably the most important, but sure. there's a few other, yeah. So if you if you really look at it, MRI's been around since the early eighties. Okay. So but the birth of MRI safety didn't come until two thousand one, right? I mean wow. it's like you think almost twenty years after MRI enters the clinical realm, now we start focusing on it. Right. Nothing's changed. We still had instances. And I mean, we still had static magnetic field, time varying magnetic fields. Yeah. And it wasn't until Michael Colombini's incident in 2001 that kind of gave a rise to this MR safety, this push for MR safety. And so we look at this event. You could say Michael Colombini is a tragic event that happened. We don't have to kind of rehash that. I think that's been discussed enough. Um, right. But it was a horrible event. But from that one event, this one child's death, We've had this birth, right, of this safety push. Mm -hmm. So this one death probably saved hundreds of lives down the road um, because we started focusing, the ACR started putting a focus on MR safety. Right. And now we started to kind of build this up to, what, 2015 when the American Board of MR Safety developed this MRSO, MRSE, MRMD exam. Mm -hmm. But the weird thing is, right, if you really look at it, instances are growing. And so we're still seeing these instances happen even after this quote unquote birth of MR safety right. and this initiative. And, and so then you ask yourself, why, right? If we're more focused on it than we were the 20 years prior, why do we see this mm. strange increase? Right. And so you, there's different different things that I think you can look at in terms of why. And you ask yourself, you know, why is this happening? And I don't think it's one particular thing. I mean, we see MRI start to develop more over the next what, 20 years since then. 
And so we're seeing more exams. We're seeing cardiac. We're seeing functional MRI. We're seeing different procedures that we're doing. We see magnets getting stronger. We see that time-varying magnetic fields are are moving faster. More devices too, right? Yeah, more devices are being released. I mean, right. and so now we've got this this start this this uh, environment this this um, uh, this this little arena that we can start to maybe increase risk. But I think what the real push is, and the real thing that's kind of getting people, is the fact that reimbursement on MRI is not like it used to be. So you have to do oh. more MRIs in order to meet that ROI. Right. And so now you have higher risk and a push to do more with less, right? right. Less techs. I mean, I think most people are working alone now in their departments, one tech per scanner. And if you're the only one working in that closet with the computer in it, you know, that one scanner, <laughs> you're by yourself. You're answering phone calls. You're treated as if you're just... You know, An octopus with multiple hands, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> someone's knocking on your door. Someone's calling you. So right. they're, you're watching your patient. And there's so many distractions then. Right. And so now we've got this environment where these cases are increasing. And if we look at this, there was an article written last year about the last 10 years. They took 1,500 um, incidents, and 59% of them were ther th uh, thermal injury-based. And there was this... Um, then there were mechanical, people hurting their backs, slipping on the floors, that count oh. for like 11%. And right. then projectiles, the missile effect, that was about you know 7%, 9%. Mm -hmm. And so we see these incidences happening still, and they're increasing. And, and, and it's probably the environment that we're put in. But I think hospitals are not taking this seriously because there's no regulation, right? No right. state, there's no federal, there's no licensures that are set. From, there's different from state to state. And so now we've got, if, if hospitals don't need to do it, they're not going to do it if it's going to impact them financially. And so the first thing we need to do is, is kind of address that, that issue. And so we've got this increase in, in instances, and then we can look at that in different ways as well. So if they happen, like you said, and from different, different right. arenas. Well, and one thing, too, that was kind of brought to my attention, and I never looked at it like this before, was, uh, you know, they've gotten better with shimming magnets, right? Mm -hmm. Before, you used to have your MRI magnet on the other side in a different building, <laughs> yep. you know, and now you literally can put them right next to the emergency department. So yep. that's giving people who normally wouldn't have access to an MRI environment, like right smack in that environment. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where when a lot of these serious, really bad injuries are happening, like the projectiles and things, it's usually because of a staff member. It's not really a patient or a family member or something like that. It's usually an uneducated staff member, right? Sure. And I think that that has to be a big emphasis too moving forward is staff training, right? Mm -hmm. Like we've got to hit that hard because uh, I feel like we're putting more magnets in and mm -hmm. they're getting closer and closer to everywhere else, right? And stronger yeah. and stronger And too. stronger and stronger, mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, you ask yourself too then, it's well, if hospitals aren't, don't have to apply or, or meet any type of um, regulatory, regulatory to, anything, right. why are they going to invest in you? Why are they going right. to invest in you to get your training if they don't really need to? And so it's kind of left up to us to train ourselves. Right. And we can look at this as kind of like a, you know, a job nine to five, or we can look at this as a career. Right. I mean, it's our job as patient advocates to keep our patients safe. If we don't do that, we're not doing our job. And so it's kind of up to us now to make sure we get the education to perform the scans and keep them safe. And so we need to be able to find that information out there and make it accessible. For sure, for sure. Nice. Right, so. That is awesome. So how long have you been on the safety end of MR? Because I know you... I've been on the safety. I, I've always had a passion for it. I've had, um, you know, I was that technologist, like most technologists entering the field, where you start, you don't get the training. I was cross-trained, so you're only as good as the person training you. Right. And and now you, you're you in this in these situations. You're faced with a neurostimulator. You're faced with something. And, and this was 20 years ago, right at that birth of MR. Mm. And now... No one knows anything. You're a tech. You don't know anything. So you're essentially the riskiest individual at that facility. Right. And so I don't like feeling that. I don't like to feel that lack of confidence in what I'm doing. I don't like to feel questioning my, what I'm doing. I want to know what I'm doing, and I want to know that my patient's safe. And so I've always had a passion for developing myself in a safety perspective. But when the American Board of MR Safety happened, that was kind of like this bulb went off. It's like now people are finally focusing on this. Now there's a right. credentialing that you can get. To say yes, I know my stuff, and these exams are very challenging. They're not. They're not easy. I, I'd say oh, they're even more challenging than the MRI exam. Really? Um, so, they're challenging. And that kind of really um, put a push from a from an organizational standpoint, from a healthcare standpoint, and saying, okay, well now there's this tool out there. This credentialing could make us look good from a, a you know accreditation standpoint, and 
And now as a technologist, I mean, we crave the, the, to prove ourselves, right? Sure. Now it's another another level to prove ourselves is like, I got another credentialing, right? I'm an MRI certified technologist, but I'm also an MR safety officer. Right. You know, so <laughs> it, that kind of was also a push. So for me, it was, it was a, you know, I, it just was a, a point for me in my career. I think like, finally, we're doing something about right. this. Finally, there's some way to prove that you know what you're, you're doing. Yeah. Um, so that was, it was, <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of was. Finally got to that top of the hill. Exactly. So now we just got to. Make our way down. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. And I find that more facilities are involving physicists and mm -hmm. um, to supervise some of these devices while they're being scanned. What's your thoughts on that? Um, there's, I mean, some or, some universities already had that down for years. I mean, they they had it set, but now these community hospitals are finally, you know, outsourcing if they don't have any in house. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of this, and I think that's that's better. We have to have resources. I mean, and even if you're a certified MRSO, there's going to be situations that you're kind of like, eh. And most radiologists that I find don't have the answers at this point. Right. Um, they should have the answers, but you know, I, I, I talked to a radiologist, it was maybe last year. They, this was the quote unquote words. It just kind of floored me. It was a patient at cardiac extent. And at the time our policies were kind of needed to be revamped. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, well we need to kind of look at this and, and make something in, in our document saying cardiac extents at a 1.5, we don't really have to go to you guys and, and talk to you. And he's like, well, we have to, because what if it tears out of their chest? <laughs> and he wasn't like kidding. It was like, this was a serious conversation. Uh, I've had and similar so, ones. Yeah. Yeah. So then you, you look at it like, we need to have the training at all levels in right. order for us to, to make sure that our patients are safe, make sure that we're making the right decisions, these benefit risk assessments to make sure that they're, they're being made correctly. Right. And so from, from a, having a physicist involved in the process, I think that's, an extra resource that we can tap on. Right. Well, and I know it helps too, because I know some of the IEC, IECC standards, like I know that it requests a professional, like some kind of physician in order to go to first level. I yes. just read that the other day and I was like, oh, really? Yeah. So most people just go to first level and don't even question yeah. it, but technically they have to be a medical supervision. Yeah. And so... Right. We should be calling a radiologist unless you build a protocol saying that, hey, this patient doesn't have any implants in them. And the radiologist says as long as they don't have a fever or anything that would compromise their, their regulatory system and that they don't have any implants in them, first level is acceptable. Right. And that's a blanket statement. Whatever uh, an organization wants to do from that perspective is, is fine. But, yeah, you're right. You should be contacting right. So we're still playing catch up in MR. Yeah. Even though we're like advancing so fast, right? It is, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Well, I know you talked to too, um, just about the percentages of the incidents that's happened last year. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the projectiles was kind of that smaller percentage, but it still seems to be the most important because that's the most lethal out of all of them. But we also have um, burns too, right? You mm -hmm. talked about thermal burns a little bit. Yeah. So can you want to talk about like how people can actually like obtain those? So yeah, burns are... are um you know, we can only get it when the, the, the machine's making its noise, right? When we're right. actually performing an acquisition. And it's because of the time varying RF that we have. So those are the, the, the so there's two risks, essentially. There's the heating up <coughs> risk, right? The, and the one main concern of having this heating is causing heat stroke, right? So we don't want to cause heat stroke in our patient, increase the temperature because they're thermally compromised in some way. And right. so we set these SAR limits. But I am not aware of one incident where a patient has received any type of heat stroke ever in the world. Right. So it doesn't mean that we have to be laxed on this. It's good. That means that we're doing our job and we have the right levels of limits in terms of heating. But when we start talking about burns, um, we can see burns in many different forms. So we see burns from a proximity burn um, where individuals can be placed in a magnet. Um, large patients, we typically see them with obese patients. Mm -hmm. And if their arms are pushed against the sides of the gantry, they're right against that RF transmitter. And so there's rungs of this RF transmitter, and if you're pressed against that within a specific distance, you can develop a dipole-dipole reaction where we get these <coughs> vibrations of, you know, atoms at those areas, kind of like a microwave. Right. And so these individuals can receive these burns, you know, first, second, third degree burns on their arms, shoulders, elbows, whatever's contacting the side there. But it's at isocenter, right? That's where our RF transmitter is located. Right. And then we have induced current loop burns. And you guys can search the MOD database, the FDA MOD database. And I mean, th these are easy to find. They're like the number one. But the one that kind of keeps me up at night is the induced current loop burns. Where, you know, a proximity burn, all these are preventable. You put right. a patient in the scanner, you put a pad of 0.5 centimeters to one centimeter between them. Make sure it's not a towel because you can't want to get saturated at all. Right. And you're done. You're fine. Do you find that with those burns, they're usually in the elbows and shoulders? Yeah, elbows, shoulders, you know, side of the arm. Right. But the ones that, that scare me is the one that induce current loop burns. Now, you know, picture you're scanning a brain, 
and you put a patient in a scanner, you're doing a brain, everything's fine, and they start screaming. I squeeze that panic ball. And you're immediate, you're, you jump, you run in the room, but they get a burn on their calf. Right. They're, they're, that's not exposed to RF. And it's because the electrical fields circulate the patient and start to go down the extremities, and any area where there's a small contact point, skin to skin, oh, right. can produce this burn. And so the thing that scares me the most is you can put a patient in there, put pads separating their legs, make sure their arms, their fingers aren't touching. But what if that pad moves out of place and they move? I mean, sometimes patients right. scratch their face and then all of a sudden they put their arm down or they touch their hands together. Right. And then this burn happens. And so right. that just is, is communication on top of keeping these um, barriers, um, making sure there's no skin to skin contact. As far as safety incidents, what, what percentage do you think that makes up? I think that proximity burns, and from my experience going through the MAW database, because I, I looked up like a thousand cases, it was just out of curiosity, because I think we can learn no, good, from yeah. other people's mistakes. For sure. The majority of them are proximity burns and induced current loop burns. Mm -hmm. And you'd think that everyone like puts so much focus on these implants, right? Right. And so everyone's so nervous about that, you know, uh, whatever, a knee replacement or whatever that is inside them. And, and, and that doesn't really account for as many of these incidences that we see. And maybe it's because we're doing such a great job. Maybe right. we're just, you know, really cautious. But I kind of want to bring forward a point, all right? So I've got a few instances that I had kind of dealt with um, in the field, and, and we can learn from each other. I think mm -hmm. that's kind of one of those those perfect things where my my experiences can, can teach right. and, and vice versa. That's the best part of MRI right Yeah, there. it is, honestly. And, and I right. think that, the, you know, the smart technologist learns from others' mistakes. Right. They don't make them themselves. For sure. And so, you know, I, I, I was a lead for many years. Um, and so I had a lot of techs I was responsible for. So I'd be doing my clerical work and I'd have, um, you know, one tech in particular, it was a little more laxed. You know, it was that tech, like, I'm busy, I'm running late. So let's get the scan done in half the time and let's stay ahead of schedule, which I think a lot of us kind of fit in that category, which is fine. I mean, we want to stay in time, definitely. Um, but I'll just call him Rick for now. You know, let's just say his name is Rick. And so Rick was bringing back a patient and uh, it was a thoracic spine for um, just general pain. And was this Rick James? No, it wasn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> different, work, yeah, different work and environment. But, um, but, uh, but so uh, he, Rick brought this patient back, and I heard them kind of chatting in the back. It's like, oh, if you had to remove it, it's fine. And so I'm like, okay, well, Rick, I, I need your help. I need your opinion. Can you come over here? So you know, Rick came over. I said, so, so what, what was removed? So the pacemaker was removed. Okay. Um, so the pacemaker was removed. And he's like, so he's fine. And I'm like, no, what's not fine? Let's just take a peek at an x-ray. What is it? What is it hurt? He's like, man, you're over. We got to get going. We're going to be late. You know, I'm like, just it, it take a minute. Let's just look at this x-ray. Yeah. Um, so we're scanning a thoracic spine at a 3T MR unit. And then so we look at an x-ray, and this guy has an abandoned pacing wire in yeah. still. And it, was, it measured 13 centimeters, which is the half wavelength of a 3T at a high risk for, right. for a burn at that point. Right. Um, and so, you know, that was my first incident with Rick. And so I said, all right, Rick, um, you know, let's, <laughs> let's not, let's talk to a rad, rad cancel exam. And so, uh, you know, another day with Rick, um, I had, uh, it was five in the morning, right? So early, we start really early. So five in the morning, no resources in the hospital whatsoever. Rick goes to get a patient, brings the patient back. And I overhear, you know, Rick talking to this patient. I go and talk to him as well, carotid stent. So Rick is like, I gotta cancel this exam. This guy's got a carotid stent. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's pump the brakes. It's five in the morning, let's talk to this guy. Where did you have it done? Who was your physician who put it in? Um, so we got all this information from him. And Rick's like, look, you're gonna kill this guy. You're gonna put him in there, we're gonna burn his neck, and it's gonna be on you. Do you want that? Do you wanna carry that with you? I said, well, if I don't scan him and he's got something going on, I'm gonna have to live with the fact that I didn't give him the care that he needed. Right. Right. And so this guy comes in, I, I look at him, he's, he's twitching, he's got arms, he was in an accident a couple days prior, couldn't really walk, his gait was off, um, a lot of pain down his extremities, couldn't lift his arm real well. Mm. And so I'm like, look, let's just spend the extra 15 minutes to see what we can do. If we can't find out, I will call a radiologist and have them make the final call, because right. I can't do that as a technologist, I'm not a physician. Right. So we contact the surgeon, the surgeon says, oh, hey, God, I can pull the chart up. I'm at home, I can pull the chart, pulls the chart up, gives us the carotid stent. We get all the information, I look it up, it's perfectly fine for MR. We scan them, one of the worst core comps I've ever seen in my wow. life. And so now you ask yourself, if I sent this patient home, because I think I saved his life by not scanning him, but I sent him home with core comp, Ooh. you know what I mean? Yeah. Would I have really helped this patient? Was I really truly a patient advocate at that point? Right. And I think we need to change the way we think. Instead of thinking the yeah. easy call, right. we're not scanning it, I don't know what it is, send him away. Right. Let's not do that. Let's actually spend the extra 15 minutes 
to make sure we're doing our best for that patient. It's actually something we learned um, with Dr. Canal's episode. Um, he really kind of dove into that. It seems like, and I mean, we, we all know who they are, but it seems like there are certain texts, as soon as there's an out, they take it. Right. Exactly. Um, even without investing the time to to try to do the right thing for the patient, which it sounds like that's your experience. So. Yeah. It Kudos is. to you. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, there's um, you know, some other thing. I, I one of the the stories too. I like to share if you you know if we don't mind is yeah, that yeah, I, I earned the title and it was maybe for a day or two. Batman, which which hey. uh, made me feel good. <laughs> so, of all the titles, that's not a bad that's one. A good one. <laughs> and so essentially, it was it was a little um, beyond just normal detective work. So a patient um, was on, on the unit, needed an MRI of the pelvis, had a history of uh, cancer, bone cancer. She was 18 years old. Ended up having surgery when she was 12. Um, had her femur, part of her femur removed, and a femur rotting. So it wasn't Rick. I don't work with Rick anymore. Um, it was a different technologist. And, and it was an honest thing. We scan femur rottings all the time. We scan joint replacements all the time. But something about this case stood out to me. Mm-hmm. And, and it was the fact that she was 18. And it was the fact that she had the surgery when she was 12. And so my thought is, well, if they're going to do surgery, most likely they're going to put in magnetically activated rod in her. So I'm like, let's just look at an x-ray. I looked at the x-ray, and yes, it was one of those magnetically activated femur rottings. Right. And so we had them look it up and research, and it was MR unsafe. But it's one of those situations where, you know, we scan femur rottings a lot of time. All the time. But situationally, it just didn't, it didn't, it just had a red flag. Right. You know? Right. And it's that a little bit of awareness. You're like, yeah. oh, she could have had that when she was 12 years old. Oh, it might have a magnet. You know, it's that awareness that really makes the difference between an incident mm-hmm. happening and an incident not happening. Preventing you know? it, yeah. Yeah. It's man, and then how do you gain that experience? It's training, right? It's training, got to get the training. Education, education, education. That's where like I pay, put all my focus in in education. I just love the idea of being able to share that knowledge. Right. And that was the, kind of the goal of Right Advantage now MRI Buzz, which is right. a community based, bringing the community together. Right. And we offer private tutoring now, so one on one tutoring for individuals who just maybe don't want everyone in the world to know. They ask a question on a Facebook group, and they just right. want to keep it more private <laughs> and down low. That is awesome. Um, but but Right Advantage, we we created this comprehensive safety course. It's 24 CE points. Um, it prepares you for the American Board of Armed Safety. It's money back guarantee that if you don't pass your boards, you get your money back. That's how confident I am on this course. <laughs> Maybe Dave can uh, pull it up real quick. <laughs> so uh, no, that's awesome. But, but um, that Be- safety training is so important. Right. And you, you said you've been working on Ride Advantage for how long? Um, since 2009. 2009. So nice. it's been a, been a while and we've been evolving and, and, and modifying and right. keeping those courses up to date. So. <laughs> it's funny because probably since 2009, the ACR requirements have probably changed only like once, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. That much. So That's crazy, right? So it's, I it's am crazy. curious about what your thoughts on the necessity of having patients change like thoroughly into a gown. Uh, some of these street clothes they come with. Yeah. Um, and what's, what's the concerns with that? So the concern would be, so any street clothes, even cotton, anything that has, um, they can leave up to 5% impurities in the fabric. So they, there's the, they allow for, for a little variance. So they might have all cotton, but there's a 5% chance that there might be something else in it, right? right. And so my thought is, we all kind of know when we've been beaten in our heads, this silver microfiber, you know, anything metallic, burn a patient. And there was an incident in 2018 with the woman with yoga pants who got that burn. Yeah. Um, but there was one case that I, I, I didn't really, um, I didn't really heard much out there. It was about this um, woman who came in and the technologist said, you need to change. She says, I'm really cold. I, I want to keep my shirt on at least. There's no metal in it. Right? Mm-hmm. But it was a Japanese fabric that was heat retardant. Oh. Okay. So they're like, okay, we'll keep it on. She had four layers of it because she was you know, very cold. Well, she went and had the MRI. When she came out, she had these two circular sunburn, you know, areas on her back. So, you know, of course, they had to report this out to the, you know, MAUD. They did right. a whole investigation. There's no metal in this fiber. No metal whatsoever. So now you ask yourself, how did she get this burn, right? Right. And so the th- leading thought of it was that this fabric was very absorbent. So it could absorb a lot of water and heating of that water in the fabric could have caused a burn. Right. I also had the luxury to go to this uh, conference on um, RF and RF uh, coils, and they, they brought up an interesting case that was reported to the, the mod. It was a person who had a normal band, wristband, uh, for, for their you know, identification, mm-hmm. and he developed a burn underneath the wristband. Well, the wristband's plastic and it's paper. Right. So how do you get that? Just the sweat, you're saying? Yeah, the sweat can also do that. It's, it's, the, it's the thought. Again, it has an, it's, right. it's the theory. Well, along those same lines, I'm curious. Should there be concern about patients who show up with wet hair? I don't, I mean, at that point, I think that when it's pushed against your skin, there's no way for that to escape. 
Yeah. Um, and then this woman with four layers of clothes on, she's laying on it. It was the contact points where she was laying on the table. Oh. Gotcha. Um, this wristband was underneath that wristband. You know, in terms of wet hair, I'm, I'm not too concerned. Um, okay. I've never, I mean, I scan that all the time. Never once had I had any issues with that. Right. Not to say that it couldn't happen. That's but why we got wood on the table. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, we're along the lines of like SAR um, and all that, like what's your thoughts on patients who show up with a severe fever? Um, severe fever. So again, we don't want to, to increase patient's core temperature. Um, uh, one degree Celsius in, in first level or right. 0.5 in, in normal mode. And so my thought is don't go to first level if you have a patient who has a, has a fever. Don't thermo If their thermoregulatory system is compromised in any way, don't, don't take them further. Um, so normal mode is basically set to say that I'm not going to cause any physiological stress to my patient. That's normal mode. Right. When you go to first level, I may cause some physiological stress to my patient, but it's within a level that's acceptable. Um, if we have second level controlled operating mode, that's like all bets are off, you know, free roam. And luckily we can't do that because I think that a lot of us would if we had the opportunity to. <laughs> is there so, a third level? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, I find like the whole thing interesting. And I think a lot of patients need to be educated on this as well. Um, and nurses and everybody really, the whole staff. Yeah. And it, actually even techs. Because um, I've, you know, constantly learning myself. I know years ago I would have thought, what's the big deal? But now, now that I know more, now right. I realize what the risks are. And exactly. I don't want to be a part of it. To um, the point where we're like, what kind of socks are those? Uh, you got to take those yeah. off. Well, there's <laughs> those copper tees. I think the copper in them, right. too. And those are the compression socks. I mean, yeah. those are the things that kind of throw you on me. And you, and you know how the, we have yeah. these patients who show up and they say, well, why do I need to change? I don't have any metal on me. Well, the, the joke that I've made and the audience has heard it before is that <laughs> you could show up. With, oh, this is what I tell patients. You could show up in a hospital gown. We're literally, I mean, literally a hospital gown. We're yeah. still going to make you change, change. Which is into good. our hospital gown. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. right. yeah, so. you don't know. You, you change them into something that you know what's on there. And I, I personally think every single patient should change. I mean, right. to the, the point where I've, I've caught things on underwear, like beads right. and, and metal. And I saw one that had a zipper on it, like on, on their underwear. Right. Like, I mean, you never know. I mean, if it eliminates that, that, you know, uh, exactly. that chance of anything happening, why not? Well, right. I actually yeah. just recently had a patient who showed up in yoga pants and asked why did she need a change. And I started talking about how there's metallic fibers out there and blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, and a lot of times the patient doesn't even realize it. And so I mentioned that 2018 incident and it turns out she was wearing the same brand. Oh, no way. Yeah. Good catch. Good so, for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, change everybody. You bet. And I think that as long as the, you start this from the beginning, from the scheduling process or from the nurse process, right. I mean, if they say, hey, you're, you're changing. I mean, that's just, that's just what it is. There's no exceptions at this point. And the same thing goes for earplugs. Right. You know, everyone gets an earplug. I yeah. People like, no, I'm fine. I, 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 I'm fine. I'm deaf anyway, so I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we want to say what hearing you still do have. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, um, well, at our facility, we not only do we give them a hospital gown, we also give them pants to avoid that skin on skin and between the thighs the and legs. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's still good too. I mean, because they can get saturated. There was one mod event that um, I had read. Again, I, I like to see these weird ones, right? Mm -hmm. And so the weird one was that this these this technologist did her best. I mean, honestly, what she did, she had the thought behind it put a patient in a scanner, it was an angio study. She put towels on the sides of their arms. And so everything was fine up to this point and um, started scanning. Well, again, she injected the contrast, scanning, the patient still came out with a burn, a proximity burn on their arm. Mm. And, and the idea was that they had a towel, the IV came out, sprayed and saturated that towel, and that ended up leading to a burn. Oh, wow. And so they always want like a pad, and I always promote the pads that are uh, moist they don't have the moisture oh. that can, they can't get saturated right and so they kind of are more repellent of, of uh, any type of uh, fluid or water well oh, thankfully we work at a facility that takes safety very serious we have the pads uh, we change everybody so and i'm i'm proud to work for a place that you know right um, is concerned about safety like that mm -hmm. and uh, there's a lot of sites that, that that don't i mean if you work for a bigger um healthcare system typically they're taking it a little more serious than some of the small right. community well, at least that's my experience for I mean, sure not, not uh I think we have an MRSO on every shift at this point, That's which awesome. is nice. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that to happen so fast, but, man, we've That's really amazing. been moving with that. I know, right? That's it where we great. need to be. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just one of those things, but, again, hospitals don't want to pay more to have an MRSO. Right. Um, and, and I think that the, the mitigation of any type of risk that you get from that is saving you money long term, right? I mean, if you have a lawsuit or have to settle... That's, that's pretty expensive. Yeah. I mean, if the average individual MRI tech is like a $300,000 settlement on average, I mean, if a hospital gets sued, I mean, you're looking at millions. Right. And what, you just pay someone, you know, an extra dollar an hour, two dollars, three, five, whatever, right. to be an MRSO and have that level of safety to kind of take that risk off the table and be responsible for it. Like, if their job is responsible for maintaining a safety program right. and, and, and following through with whatever the MRMD says, 
I mean, you're saving money. I mean, you're, I think yeah. any risk assessor would look at that and say, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is what it boils down to is education. I agree 100%. Yeah. Um, education for everybody involved, even patients. Um, I mean, that's hard to do. But just, I think sometimes providing these uh, videos kind of helps. Right, um, right kind of education. And websites like yours, for sure, where you offer those tra that training. Podcasts. Um, yeah. Um, we can go split. I don't know if you we ever did go time. screen on screen and show his website. Now, we do still want to talk more in depth about this website on a different episode. So we're just going to give you just a quick look, glance at what it looks like. But it looks like you've been doing this for years. I mean, mm -hmm. um, we cover everything from our cardiac, uh, cardiac MR. We do op image optimization. So like if you want to take your images and, and know exactly what your TR is doing to your image and that TE to get that. I, I call it taking the you can have a technician. Right. So that whole MRI technician, everyone hates that term. But I think there are technicians out there. There are people right. who just go there, press the button, don't know what they're doing. Right. And then you have the MRI technologist, right? Someone right. knows what they're doing. But then I say there's another level. There's the MRI artist. Where you can oh, take that. That's, yeah, and you that's can take Yeah, you can pull out. Yeah, that, that you pull out those those pathology, make them pop. Right. And so I've got a lot of examples on the site too where um, you can look at a tumor in the cord. And depending on what your TE is, you can make that pop out more, like this um, low low density uh, mass. You can right. make that really stand out. Well, I think it is in our, we discussed that before. It's, uh, it's uh, imaging. Um, but, you know, I don't think everyone gets into it for you know, the passion and the love and, you know, just being around everyone. I think a, a lot of people who are those artists and those, you know, advanced technologists or people who just spend you know a lot the, of time. You know who they are at your facility. It. Yeah. But um, it does. It takes a lot of your does. own time. And it's it all really on you does. guys. I mean, like if, 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 if those tech, MR technologists out there, you got to invest the time right. for yourself. Right. Um, because the more you know, the less insecure you're going to be at your job, the better your patients are going to be treated, the less callbacks you're going to have. Um, you're not going to be faced with the situations where you're scared when you get that neurostimulator and you have to go through all those MR conditions that are ridiculous right. and meet them. You're not going to have that second guessing yourself. You're going to go into your job every single day, know exactly what you're doing and know how to bring out that pathology right. and be an inspiration to other technologists around. It's contagious, yeah. right? I'm, I'm inspired feeling, right? by a lot of yeah. my coworkers for yeah, sure. Yeah, me too. We've lucky to have a couple of them on here yeah. actually. Um, I'm inspired by Robert. <laughs> right? He's a man. Thank, Thank you, real. Reggie. Yeah. <laughs> Even though, like, at our work, he's the head honcho. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Fake it till you make it, everybody. <laughs> but as I mentioned before, we also want to provide education for our patients, too. So you mentioned earlier, like, how a lot of people focus big on, like, say, a knee replacement. And, um, and that's super confusing to them. Why would, that wouldn't be concerning to us. Could you just kind of explain, like, conditional versus non conditional? And, layman's terms sure. to, to those people? So the, there's a term that we hear a lot, MR compatible, and that's not a term that we use, right? Mm -hmm. So when someone says to me, oh, it's MR compatible, that's a red flag for me saying, okay, this guy doesn't know, or woman who has no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. right. And so an MR safe object is one that is not metallic, not magnetic, or not electrically conductive, right? So those are the earplugs, blankets, you know, cotton, assuming that there's no silver fibers or anything copper in them. And then we have MR conditional. So MR conditional is anything that is metallic, electrically conductive, or magnetic, mm -hmm. or a combination of the, of the of them all. And so when we look at that and we say, okay, well, there's an object that has and meets these MR conditional standards, we have to say, what are these conditions? And so according to the ASTM, we have to say, these, these conditions have to have, at a minimum, a magnetic spatial gradient defined, the B0 defined, and the time-varying gradient and so, in RF. Right. defined so those have to have, have those limits at a minimum defined and now some manufacturers don't put them all on there and then you need to again question that as a legit um set of conditions because they have to at a minimum be zero <coughs> magnetic spatial gradient and time varying magnetic fields at a minimum some throw in artifacts <coughs> the size of an artifact as well which is which is fine and so they have to at a minimum have those limits and now an mr unsafe object is something that can pose a threat to our patient or has not been tested right so I'm, I'm assuming that the scissors that you have that you bring to the scanner have not been tested for MR safety, <laughs> right. but they're considered MR unsafe because they haven't been tested. Right. So the object has to be tested, shown not to have a threat if you meet certain guidelines, and then they, it gets labeled MR conditional. If right. it hasn't been tested or it has shown to cause an injury, then it's MR unsafe. Can you explain the difference between ferrous and non-ferrous metal? Sure. So, so we have ferrous metals, and it has a susceptibility greater than one. So those are things that are attracted to a magnetic field. And it's not just attracted. They're uh, objects that will translate towards a magnetic field or rotate and torque in the scanner, but they're ones that also maintain the magnetic field when you take them out. So they still become a magnet themselves as you take them out. That's a ferrous object. Right. 
those are your, there's three ferrous metals. There's cobalt, nickel, and, st- and iron. And so then there's also different um, alloys, so stainless steels. Right. Um, and so there's a few of them that are still, you know, ferretic and, and, and all that. some of them are considered ferrous. Right. And then you have non-ferrous, which is essentially anything that's diamagnetic or paramagnetic. So we have diamagnetic objects like gold, silver, that have a negative susceptibility. They're actually slightly repulsed by a magnetic field. And then you have paramagnetic, which have a measurable but non-visual, typically, uh, attractive force. Real quick, I can stop you, but is that the reason why patients say sometimes they feel their rings vibrating? That's from a Lorenz force. So it's the same thing when you hear the gradients in there. Um, if there's vibrating, there's um, competing magnetic fields. Mm-hmm. And it's also a lenses force. I guess it would be more of a lenses force. So you have this, this vibration of the metal. It's a conductive metal, gold, silver. It's highly conductive. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing that Dr. Canal uh, shows videos of this when he brings a pan into the room, right? Oh, and he lets go of it, slowly. and it slowly goes there. Yeah. But if you were to activate the magnet, you'd have a, another changing magnetic field of gradients on top of it, right? Oh, right. And so right. that's creating different directional magnetism. So if you ran an axial with that pan on there, and I don't recommend doing it. I, I'm, I'm, like, too scared to even try it. <laughs> um, but they'll, it'll vibrate just like those rings do. Right. Okay. And it's because, again, the same thing, those forces. As, as uh, Lenz's force says, if you, you create a, an opposing magnetic field in the direction that you move it through a B0. And so now you have this B0 that's it's changing that's on top of it. And it's going right. to vibrate this thing rapidly. And so that's what people get when they buy the rings that vibrate. I mean, I don't, I haven't heard of any incidences or injuries that come from that. But well, I've, I've noticed that uh, happening with some of the actual MR conditional like uh, leads and uh, devices that we put on the patients to monitor them while they're in the scanner. And if you don't put it in the on the table the right way it's supposed to, uh, it actually will do that vibration, and that's what actually causes a lot of that artifact that we tend to get on some of those. So, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Mm-hmm. It is an interesting phenomenon. Right. right? But it's, it's jarring for that patient when you don't tell them that also, like, their, their rings are vibrating and they're like, what is going on? <laughs> right. Yeah. And it can be confusing, too. I understand why. If a patient's told, like, got to remove all metal and they say, do I need to take my wedding ring off? And I say, no. I, if I was that patient with no knowledge, I would think that doesn't make sense to me. And, 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 and there's different philosophies and different schools of philosophy. I personally think jewelry should be removed. Why, why introduce a potential risk when you don't need to? But there's a lot of physicists out there that will say, look, the size of a ring is less than two centimeters in size. And, and every study that at least I've read out there hasn't shown significant heating, if at all, anything less than two centimeters in size. And, and so the ring is not going to heat up. It might vibrate. That's, it's not going to you know, knock their finger off or anything like that. It'll just be uncomfortable and scary. But then I, I want to ask you guys this. If the ring can vibrate, what about the hip replacement, right? That's conductive, but the patient doesn't say that they're feeling that because it's inside of the body. But there's been studies out there that have shown that there's small vibrations in these implants, and that could potentially cause long-term effects for a patient. Oh, that's interesting. So it's just a different, same concept, but different way of looking at it. Right. You know what I mean? From yeah. more of an implant. Yeah, and I've actually done some almost brand new hip implants too. So they're not even in there long enough to get the scar tissue and everything. Yeah. That's a very good point. So what would you yeah. find nowadays as far as ortho implants? Um, and, and there might have been like, you know, from 2000 and on, we've been using titanium. And before that, um, I mean, what would you say is mostly made of um, ortho implants, that is? I would say ortho implants are typically that stainless steel 316L. You know, I, I, I haven't ran to one in my career over 20 years that have shown to be you know, fair is enough to cause issues to our patient where yeah. they would have to have conditions to say that it's unsafe. Um, not to say that they're not out there. I mean, I would never make that statement. Um, I haven't run into it. Anything that's magnetically activated, though, I definitely want to investigate because now we're introducing something different. The direction of our B0, horizontal ver- versus vertical, can make a difference. I mean, and, and those little subtleties can make a difference um, as well. And so those are the things that kind of, you know, I look and everyone has the Harrington rod, you know, worry. But again, I, I personally have not read. There was only one mod that a patient had a Harrington rod and developed a warm spot on the top of their head. Oh. So it was like a hot spot is what we right. would call it on top of their head. And so they just stopped imaging. But again, that comes down to communication with your patient. But, you know, talking to some of the professionals out there, um, there really haven't been many instances per se involved in Harrington rods. Again, I'm talking about anything that's non-magnetically activated, oh, just right. the standard um, you know, writing like passive devices. Type yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as long as we're talking about foreign bodies, metallic foreign bodies, let's talk about bullets and shrapnel. What's your thoughts on that? Um, oh, yeah, orbit X rays. Yeah, so orbit X rays are big. I mean, there was um, you know very few, maybe one or two accounts in people you know, having injuries to their eyes involving that. I think that if it's a penetrating injury, we definitely want to get those orbits. Now, right. if it's a it's a, a bullet, I mean, I've had a, a patient who said they were shot in the arm. Okay, well, let's just get an X ray. 
it doesn't it doesn't hurt to find out. And what we're looking for is number one: is it next to anything vital? Nerves, vessels, um, and if they're not, then we're probably fine. Right. But again, a radiologist has to make that decision. A technologist can't. And there's so many technologists out there. It's like, eh, it's fine. I've been fine. wanting to use this word for so long, and I'm happy that I finally have a context <laughs> for it. Should we have get a countdown or a drum roll? <laughs> <laughs> Superficial migration. <laughs> so okay. they're not really worried about that. No, no, they're not worried about it at right. all. And I think that if it is superficial, you can, number one, test it with a tester magnet or anything like that. Right. But you can compression it. If you put a compression on it, I mean, where's it going to go? Yeah, I just recently, probably about two, three months ago, I had a patient with a BB in her wrist, took a magnet to it, and you can see it. It pulls. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's jarring. Like, you're like, right. And we put uh, just some Coban on it, and it's scanned. Fine. We had um, a guy wow. who um, was shot in the pelvis um, during... Like, and so you don't know what that's in there. And it was in his pelvis. And so we have an MRMD, and he's a little more educated, I think, than, you know, majority out there. So he kind of knows his stuff. And so, you know, our first thing is, you know, Rick would say, cancel the exam, save his life. But again, you know, look at it. Every situation is different. Right. Every every patient's different. Every um, every situation is different. So right. we did a, a CT. We had a CT, a prior CT. And we looked and we saw it was lodged in bone. Right. So the radiologist is like, well, let's scan it. And he was fine. The patient was completely fine because it was in bone. It's not going anywhere. Right. And it was long enough that, you know, it's, it's been in there a while. Wow. Now, you touched on time-varying magnetic fields a little bit, but neurostimulation. So I just found out that, I guess, neurostimulation is pretty safe, but everyone kind of can experience it differently. But it is by the standard that you cannot stimulate the heart. Or cardiac tissue? So the, the threshold right? that's met in first level is right. half the potential that's needed to stimulate the heart. Now, if you go into second level, that's a different story. I mean, mm. you could potentially stimulate the heart. But the risk of stimulating the heart without an implant, I mean, I'm talking no leads, no band leads, nothing like right. that in there, um, are, are minimal because we're only half that potential. Now, when you introduce wires into the heart and other things, I mean, that could change the situation. Again, everything's situation-based. Right. And as an MR safety officer or something who has safety knowledge, that's, I mean, you'll know all those yeah. subtleties they in order to make it. Quick, yeah. Now, when it's interesting that you say that, you know, in terms of stimulation, because when you look at the stimulation, I've read two mod reports that had to do with stimulation. And again, you don't really hear it. Someone yeah, can't, like, right. someone's got nerve, peripheral nerve stimulation and they're going to cancel the exam. But there was two cases that kind of stood out. And one of them, they're kind of basically the same. The patient goes in the scanner, right? has the scan localizer right. during the localizer, she says my face is tingling right it feels like it's it's it's, it's twitching and, and i think we've all probably had patients say you scan a lumbar spine their leg feels like it's switching or they're like right. i swear i'm not moving in there i'm not moving <laughs> dancing on the table we're, we're, you know and so this patient said she had some you know tingling in her face and so they stopped the exam talked to her talked to the radiologist Rio says well let's continue we'll talk to them a little bit more um, so they did the scan started the localizer over again patients right. a little tingling and it didn't go away sent the patient to ED, and the patient just had this, this tingling in her face that never seemed to go away. And now, is it from the MR? Is it not? I mean, again, right. when, you have, when you read any mod report, it's minimal. It's like one paragraph of like four sentences, <laughs> and that's it. I mean, it's, it's a poor... Right. Uh, I had actually a similar incident happen. Uh, we were testing out a sequence, and it might have transitioned into second level or something. And... You know, I'm just in there because I want to be a good patient. I'm in a MRI attack, right? You know, <laughs> I got a reputation to keep. So I'm in there trying to hold my breath, but I'm like, I feel like I'm breathing, but I'm not type of thing. But we're looking at the abdomen, or maybe it was the cardiac. I don't really remember. But um, I, after a while, I, I couldn't take it anymore. So I squeezed the ball and I'm like, everything okay? And I come out and I'm like, my face was just kind of like, just a little twitchy and my voice sounded different. No way. Yeah, it was really weird experience. Yeah, but it it, it, it like subsided and I would say like not even an hour. It kind of went away, but it lasted a lot longer than I was expecting. I'm like, should I go to the emergency room? Like, is this a, a, a real MRI injury? <laughs> now, let me ask you this. Did you did you report that to the mod? Mm. And so, and again, I think when we look at these numbers, I remember we, we had mentioned, you know, last year they had a study, there was 1,500 cases. Right. I think that there's a lot more cases out there, and I think most professionals out there do agree because right. are you reporting it? Let's say you bring um, scissors into the room and no patient's in there and it flies and right. it hits something. Well, you take it out of the room, you know. Right. You know it's just me. It's just oh, me, sure me, in, me in the room, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that happens a lot, but that should be reported. Anything that's brought in that it's fairs, any near misses, it's not just the ones that cause a burn or the ones that cause. And I think right. that's why we see so many burns. I, I'd expect that projectiles would be higher because... 
you know, but we can hide a projectile. You can hide it, yeah. But you can't hide a burn, mm -mm. you know. That's so. a good point, yeah. <clears throat> Wow. Well, one thing we haven't discussed as far as MRI safety, and I think it's definitely an issue we should cover, is um, the administration of MRI contrast, gadolinium. So uh, what's, what experience have you, have you had with that? There's a new regulation, safety? too, out there. What's so, the business stuff, right? Well, yeah, um, there's, there's different agents out there. Too. I think there's one from GE that they just released as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when, in the world of gadolinium, it's so hard to talk about it because we can talk about it today and then tomorrow there'll be – you know, new data out there. Right. So I'm, I'm very hesitant to bring up any statistics based on that. And it's a very controversial subject, by the way. And it really too. is. I didn't realize until um, we released an episode on it. Yeah, right. and so you, you'll definitely get a lot of um, passion, passionate people yeah. right. and, yeah. and opinionated people on this topic. Yeah. But I think that as long as we read the studies and we're, we do our best to keep up with whatever data is released out right. there, I mean, every agent will get retained in our patient, right? Every agent. It's not just one or the other. Agents, different agents will retain at different rates in different areas of the body, depending on um, what the agent is. So, right. Well, and I think too that I think we we need to remember that it needs to be administered when it's clinically necessary. You know, as long as we stick to that guideline, I feel like you can't do any wrong. You know, because it's, it's what's best for the patient. Well, definitely. You know, right. I, I started MRI when it, you know to, before two thousand six when the whole nephrogenic systemic fibrosis wave you know, hit, and, and we would give. You know, runoff. It's like, oh, give them four, to, you know, quadruple dose. You know, it's right. fine. We want to make sure this is good. You know, right. you know, we'd be giving them a hundred cc's of gadolinium, and, right. and and it was not even, you know, no one even questioned it. And and then luckily, I mean, unfortunately for many patients out there, but again, it takes, you know, unfortunately we're reactive in this industry, and an incident like this happens, and now we make these changes down the road. Right. And so. Luckily, we made these changes, and and we've seen those instances kind of get wiped out. Right. I think with. Um, just the uh, improvements with the technology and imaging and also the education with the radiologists, I could see uh, lots and lots less, or that's kind of oxymoron, but a lot, lot less, uh, <laughs> it's kind of weird to say, <laughs> administration of contrast. I, right. I could definitely see that happening. It seems like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, we, but we see it where they order uh, contrast for a headache and you don't need contrast for a headache or pain. Sure. Um, what if I guess it depends on what it's for, but um, True. you get my point. But yeah, we're no doctors. <laughs> I guess along the lines with the contrast administration, the safety concerns with it. There's also uh, reaction rates, and so what's your what's your knowledge of that? And so I mean, and, and this is again, you know, you, you you go, you get an. I have an interview with, let's say, you know, Bayer, and then we talk about an agent from them, and, and they'll say, well, you know, you know, Multihance, the the, the Brocco, their agents horrible. People are vomiting like crazy, and you talk to the Brocco, and they're, well, you know, like Adivis, they have two p right. potential cases of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis in Europe, and and. And so, you said that really fast, by the way. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I had to think about it first. Oh, did you? Sorry about that. <laughs> but, I represent multi <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, but, but essentially, you know, it depends on who you talk to, you know. Right. And, and But again, it's it's us as an individual to get the facts, right? Right. A vendor is going to tell you what you want to hear to buy their agent. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, most of us technologists are hearing what the vendors are telling us. Um, so from a statistic standpoint, I mean, agents, you know, I read one study. Again, even the studies contradict themselves, you know? So one study says Gadibus has higher rates of vomiting patients. And then I read another study where it was, no, it was Multihance who had a higher, you know? Right. And so what, who's right and who's wrong? I mean, I guess it's, it depends on who did the study. Um, well, did, but, did you hear about, uh, I guess, the FDA's uh, pullback for testing for GFR for like two of their contracts? I, I didn't think Gadibus and Doderum. Because uh, there's been no shown instances of NSF or at least yeah. low amount. So the ACR manual on contrast mean it basically says that if you have a group two agent, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the, the pro hands, multi hands. Uh, and is that macrocyclic? Is that linear? Um, they're they're um, they're either linear ionic or macrocyclic. So we have um, multi hands was a uh, linear ionic right. agent. And so if you have a group two agent, you don't have to do any type of screening for for labs, and you don't have to. Um, perform get a GFR on these these agents. It's up to the site. But if you have a group one or a group three, and the group three is the EOVIST, and the group ones are obviously the ones you don't ever want to use. Um, so then you need to get labs for them. I see. It was the ACR, not FDA, sorry. Yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> the, the, the FDA, FDA does kind of follow the problem a little bit. Right. No, for sure. Um, well, I know I do personally have an experience with an anaphylactic reaction. I know with uh, contrast, it's like less than one percent, and it's usually headaches and stuff like that. And occasionally, you'll see patients with hives, but you don't see that very often. I mean, in my career, like I think I've been doing MR about seven years, but not. Um, I actually have seen one anaphylactic reaction, um, and maybe you know you've had a few patients that throw up, and I think that's mostly just because it was injected too fast. Yeah. Um, 
But I don't know. I think maybe I've had one patient with hives. Um, you don't see it very often. I think patients, uh, they hear a lot about the experiences with CT contrast and how it's a higher yeah. reaction rate, and they assume the same. Mm -hmm. Right. It does have a higher rate, um, reaction rate for CT contrast than MR, but, you know, we look at everything. So if they have a reaction to CT, there's a higher likelihood that they're going to have a reaction to MR contrast as well. Right. It's kind of like looking at all the little factors that could potentially increase risk in our patient is important, and just keeping an eye on them is important because you don't know what the reaction is going to be. And it's also this this Weber effect, which, you know, I'm sure if you, if you brought this up with Dr. Canale, he's, you know, he, he'd bring this up. And it's this this idea that, you might see when you introduce a new agent into your site that there's going to be an increase in events and they'll eventually die off. And I think, you know, Weber effect basically says it's like a two-year period of time or whatever it right. is. And don't quote me on that. But <laughs> um, but essentially that there's a there's a duration of time where you see this increase in incidences. Um, I've talked to some reps and, you know, and i kind of seen this, but I don't know if you guys have seen during allergy seasons, like, you know, in the transition of seasons or whatever, that you see these higher incidences of patients maybe they're like vomiting or maybe they're getting hives more. So, I mean, that there might be some correlation there. I mean, I, right. you know, I don't know, but. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, this, I'm a huge technology buff, so I have. He's a nerd, is another way of uh, saying it. <laughs> <laughs> what you think about some of the new technology that's kind of on the rise and how it's going to sure. change MRI safety. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've noticed is how they're acquiring more signal with less data. So uh, I guess there's a lot of algorithms out there. Most likely it's AI use um, where you know, you, you don't need to spend the same amount of time actually acquiring that data to boost your signal. And in my head, that translates to lower field magnets, you know? Like, um, and then there's also, um, so we'll, we'll say that's software-based, but there's also hardware-based where there's new, like, um, like signal boosting material that they can uh, start utilizing to help boost signal too. So I feel like there's a lot of advances that are coming there to definitely signals, is. right? And so what does that do in terms of safety as well? I mean, I know that there was right. clothing that people can put on, like a like a sleeve that's a coil in itself. So, I mean, what do they always say? They say that oh, the coil right. that fits the size of the body part is the optimal signal that's and cool, the ones that's yeah. closest to the body part. So now they're creating this like elastic type of coils that go on the body part itself and that helps right. boost signal what, as well. Uh, what vendor does that? Oh, the no vendor. It's self research, I think, at this oh, point. Oh, okay. Because I'm aware vendors. of the air coil, um, right. which I'm sure you are as well. GE, I believe, makes that. But NDA, NDA. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to so, be continued on. <laughs> but essentially, you know, like it's, um, you know, there's different technologies out there, and again, it's kind of like you look at CT. I mean, how do they get rid of noise? Noise is random, and so right. when we run like increase our averages in MR, so you take your averages, your next whatever vendor you're on, and you run two of them, you get. A reduction signal by square root of two because noise is random. So if you rerun re your case base twice, uh -huh. noise won't appear in the same uh, place, the and you can alliterate. So you average right. those two together. So, right. and so when you look at noises, and they have iterative algorithms in CT to help optimize um, uh, their images and reduce noise in their images, and, and you know CT or MRI could potentially do the same thing, right? I mean, right. we can create algorithms that help reduce noise in that. I mean, right. So, so I think that's impressive because I feel like what how that can translate into the field is. You know, these um, open magnets or, you know, our traditional low field magnets might be more utilized simply because now you can get that 3T signal at mm -hmm. maybe a 0.7 or a 0.5, you know. Um, and at a 0.5, how far your Gauss line goes and things like that, you know, so it's true. Right? And if you read most conditional label, they'll say it's fine at 1.5 and 3T. Right. That's it. I mean, yeah, so that means it. that if you scan them at a 1 on T, you can't do that because it's off right. label unless your radiologist approves it. But right. So now what does that do in long term in terms of conditions that have already been written out there? And it's expensive to go right. and go through this whole process. Test everything, yeah. Test everything, so. Well, this has been kind of a fun conversation. Yeah, um, yeah we enjoy having well, you. I want to so curious, I'm kind of like, what's your thoughts on like, uh, what would be your suggestions for what should be included for a safety screening form for an a patient. All right, so that's, I mean, that's, that's Tattoos awesome. Tattoos gotta be on there, right? Yeah, so, so, that, so I, I kind of sat down one time, so I was, again, like I said, I was part of this safety initiative mm -hmm. for my, my, my um, healthcare system. So I, my thought was, how do you approach this thing? We, we, we have this, you know, our normal Frank Shellog you know, sheet or whatever you print up that says, do you have a nerve stimulator? Do you have a pacemaker? Do you have this? Right. And how many patients understand what this is? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know what this is, so I must not have it. Right. And so um, I kind of rethought the whole MR safety screen sheet process. And I made it more geared towards technologists or the patient instead of the technologist. Oh, nice. And so I said, um, it starts with a, have you had brain surgery? Category of every brain implant they can potentially have. Have you ever had abdomen surgery? Every abdomen implant they can have. Every. So then the patient goes through and says, okay, if I had brain surgery, 
and they, they check no, well then it's no for all of them. And they know, and if they've had brain surgery, you know, I would say 90% of them know what it is. Right. So then they can go down that list and pick which one it was. Is it a coiling? Is it oh, aneurysm? Nice. Is it whatever? Right. And so I broke it up in body parts. And I also thought it was important, too, because you got to keep the screen, same screen sheet for your whole personnel and patient, you know, volume. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you need to have a category for inpatient direct. So do, do they, are they coming down with um, event, oh. events? Are they coming right. down with any oh, other equipment, or, pumps or anything? Yeah. Leads Slides. on and stuff. Do they have any, like, uh, swan gans, you know, with, yeah. you know, do they have any of that stuff in? And that's important. Right. Do they yeah. need meds? I mean, are they claustrophobic? And, it's, and it can be so you know, like overcome. Or... Like I feel like the screening forms can get so long yes. that it it almost defeats the purpose, right? Mm-hmm. It so it sounds nice. like you just break it down and simplify. It. Actually, that's the kind of way I verbally screen patients. I mean, obviously, I still get a screening form on them, but I'll just say right. like, have you ever had brain surgery, heart mm-hmm. surgery, ear eye surgery? Exactly, and, and that's you're you're saying it to a patient so they understand it. Yeah. Why don't right. we just give them a sheet? That they can understand, you know. I mean, like, right. I think that we're we're we missed something there, you know. Right. We're we're gearing it towards us, and there's a lot. All those things on those sheets on, and the standard sheets are important, right? But, but it's no it, good if the data's not good. Exactly. Right? And if there's too much of it, patients are gonna be like, "Oh my God, I'm on the on the fiftieth question. I'm, I just want to get this exam done, go home. I've got to right. go somewhere. I've got." By the way, we just want you to hurry up and fill it out so we can go. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Come on, hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> so. And simplifying it. Have you had brain surgery? Yes. Have you had abdomen surgery? Yeah. I mean, then, then you can go through and you know, focus on the areas that you need to. Yeah. You know, so um, that's kind of my approach at the screening sheet. But I think that okay, everything that you have is potentially important, right? I mean, right. clothing to um, that brain implant. And so right. that should all be on the sheet, but we should structure it in a way that is not as cumbersome for the patient. You know? right. It's just direct. Well, again, this has been a fun conversation. Yeah, thank um, you, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Was there any like specific incidents that you did want to discuss, or was, did you um, kind of I mean, kind of cover them? We pretty much covered them. I mean, okay. we could go we can go right. on for another hour or two if we I wanted know, right? to. <laughs> well, let's take a lunch break. But uh, one it's thing we do. Weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, <I> go. <laughs> One thing uh, we do ask all our guests, and I'm definitely interested in hearing your answer, is uh, what would you find has been the most satisfying experience or part of your career? Um, you know, I, I always, uh, you know, I'm a big on the education piece. So I'm mean, you know, a clinical instructor to, you know, educator at college and, and staff and all that. It's that aha moment, moment you see in those, those, those technologists' eyes. Like, you, know, you, you explain to your students, and they're like, oh, my God, this guy's talking a different language. But it's like that, that point when they're like, I get it. You know, I had a tech the other day, like literally a week ago, and we were going through um, the system. The radiologist said, the patient has MS. I want you to run a flare in the spine, but I want it fat set. And there was a technologist that's been there forever said, why fat set? I don't want fat set. So I asked the tech, I said, well, how do you know what's in the spine? I mean, is it MS? Is it a cyst? Is it fat? I mean, we need to suppress the things that we don't want to see. And she's like, you know what? That makes it sense to me and it's that evolution I mean, and i think right. that is that moment and as a i mean you you guys seem like you're very educated too and you and, right. and just to see when you're teaching someone that moment where like they get it that all that right. effort you put in those that year of, of 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 blood sweat and tears you know it pays off and i just love that moment right. I, it's I rewarding just had an aha moment literally last week <laughs> 10 years in and i, I just now am really wrapping my head around the concept of case space Yes. Man, and that's a tough concept, but I feel like I actually can really understand it now. It's a good feeling. Yeah, and that, that is a tough feeling. one, too, and that, that yeah. Fourier transformation. All that. Right. That is like... It's like... Because you can't really visualize it. Mm-hmm. And Not the way easily. that you want to visualize it just messes you all up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's rewarding to education, that side of it, um, for sure. I've worked with some new techs and... Right. Um, that are you know there to learn and uh i'm happy to teach the very little that i basically i'm happy to teach what i've learned from others basically mm-hmm. so uh i did a, a speech one time too on, on on um the legends and myths of mr you know and how that could become dangerous oh, right good, so yeah. you know like I, I for years when i started at cross training there's um you know um will you script your patient when you give contrast well there's an iron-based contrast agent there's no i mean unless you have a you know what i mean so you're, you're so you could be passing the wrong information down. And right. so you want to make sure that's the right, you're, you're learning from the right people. Right. Like sure. You're only as good as the person who's training you. Exactly. And a lot of yeah. people, I feel like, start off in MR super excited, but they end up getting trained with someone who's like already burnt out and just going through emotions. And they kind of start carrying on those type of traits. And mm-hmm. it's such a waste. And I really feel like... Um, you know, people who are new should be trained with people who are motivated and or hungry you know, to learn and stuff hungry. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that passion. And Got you, the passion. That's yeah, what it you're comes just down. a newer, newer tech that coming into the field. They have that passion, and then just, right. just to leverage that passion right. and, and play off it is just, just amazing. Well, it's right. exciting to see your passion. Actually, I'm really impressed. Um, Super excited that you came to visit us. Thank yeah, you today. Thank you so thank much, you honestly. It, right? I, uh, this has been a, a great opportunity, so I appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks. and actually, we're hoping to link up with you again. This SR, SNAR. 
SRNA? No. RSNA. 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 <laughs> we swear we work in uh, MRI. Yeah. <laughs> no, that'll be And fun. ironically, MRI is another acronym, so we're yeah. not good with acronyms, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but we're planning on meeting up RSNA. That'd be fun, yeah. Uh, hopefully it's not virtual this year, but again, thank you. No, um, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank Matt you. came all the way from Chicago to come visit us, so yeah. we really appreciate your time. <laughs> and you uh, your knowledge that you're happy to share, so thank you, thank you. Yes. Reggie, anything else? Hey. It's on three podcasts. We're out, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.